a great deal of hope and care and responsibility. Um, and so communicating with him regularly when he used to come to the UK with the other uh, military lawyers, and of course, Michelle herself. I met her, I think, in 2005 first, um, when she was doing her book, uh, Guantanamo's Child. Since then, we've met s s a, a couple of times. And uh, I I've seen these key individuals come. Uh, and there are people who are connected to the story right from the beginning. Um, Dennis is certainly one of them, but also so is Michelle. And, and keeping on top of what's been going on um, through these channels has been really important. Just one thing I really would do want to say, 14 uh, years ago, Guantanamo was open. We had the anniversary just a, mm. a few days ago. Myself, Shakar Amar, who's a former British um, resident, uh, he's a British resident who was formerly in Guantanamo 14 years. Uh, and Ruhal, who you saw in the, uh, in the film, we all got together, uh, stood outside the US Embassy, and we had a great surprise. And the surprise was this, that um, Ruhal had been contacted by Omar via um, FaceTime. So we were standing outside the, <laughs> the, um, the US Embassy calling for Guantanamo to be closed. And we have this discussion with, with, <laughs> with, with Omar Khadr um, through FaceTime, which was amazing because Shakar Amar took Omar under his wing as he had done the other 14-year-old uh, as a kind of father figure to look after the, these kids who had, um, for all intents and purposes, lost their, their childhood. When you watched the film, what did you think? It what did it manage to convey about the experience? Where did it fall short, the way all films are going to fall short for someone who's living that nightmare? Well, the first thing I thought is that um, I'm wearing the same jumper as I was in the film. <laughs> <laughs> but, but not after that. <laughs> it's continuity. Yeah. It's excellent. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a part of the story that you'll never get to see. No matter how much we tell, tell it and relate it, the lawyers who go there, everything that we tell them in Guantanamo is classified. Mm -hmm. So if we get released, as happened to me, um, I got released and asked for detailed notes that I'd given to Clive Stafford with my lawyer there. He said, I'm sorry, I, I can't give you those notes because they're classified. <laughs> and so essentially, a lot of this is about um, humanizing that story or getting that story out. But there's a, going to be a part when you can't film a person's face, you're not allowed to show what he looks like, what his expressions are, what he feels, <coughs> his humanity. Um, you can only do that after the prisoner has been released. And <coughs> as you may have noticed, there's only two former Guantanamo prisoners who spoke in that film. Yet there are hundreds. Everybody in Guantanamo, everybody knows Omar Khadr. But how many of them can speak, are in a position where they can speak based on numerous reasons? either because they're from a country where if you speak about Guantanamo, uh, you're going to get imprisoned again, or because you've been so traumatized, you're afraid, or a whole host of other reasons. So that part of the story will never come out. Corey, as a lawyer, you're watching Dennis Edney. You're following the case from a distance. Mm. He didn't have an organization like Reprieve behind him. Um, what are your thoughts on his performance as a lawyer as opposed to a character? When people, you know, so much of what the Guantanamo lawyer has to do isn't traditional legal work in any event, right? I think our main role is to try to overcome exactly the barrier that Mosem describes, which is to get these stories past the censors and into the world to try to convey these people's essential humanity. I think for a solo practitioner to do something for Omar is absolutely extraordinary, really. I mean, the burden on a solo practitioner like that to, to try to represent someone is just huge. and the. And the dedication, I think, of him. The, the, I, that that interaction, I was really very moved, actually, by watching the kind of interaction, the almost familial relationship that he had with Omar, because it so did remind me of the times that I spent with, with Muhammad, this kid who was, as I say, just 14 when he was taken to Guantanamo, who learned English when he was in Guantanamo, whose first word, because he was black, was the N-word taught to him by US soldiers. But that, that kind of that closeness, um, you know, and that, and also, I think the thing that really got me actually was that moment that when he describes the first moment he leaves his client there, and Omar says, "Well, everybody leaves me," because that is that 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 sense of kind of tearing away and leaving someone there. I was interested to know what you thought about that part, that 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 sense of kind of the danger of somebody coming in with hope, as as Clive or whomever does, and gesturing and saying, "Never mind, we're going to get you out of here. It's going to be fine." And then the door closes, and they go, and you're silent. Because from our side, the guilt is just profound. It 
absolutely profound. Um, but I can only, I, I mean, it's just, I can only imagine what it's like to have that silence as the god. Uh, I remember, uh, I mean, just to be clear, the, I only knew Omar in, in Bagram. I didn't know him in Guantanamo. I was in solitary confinement in, in Guantanamo, so I never got to see him. But I learned of him through guards and interrogators and <coughs> so forth. Um, the last thing that I, that he said to me in Bagram I, is also, also almost a, a central theme th throughout his whole story. He said, it seems to me that you've got people who care about you. I, was, I got letters from family. Um, he said, nobody cares about me. And when I saw that relationship build or develop with, with Dennis Edney, I think and thought and, and continue to think that he's found somebody who cares about him. But it is also important to mention that despite all the stuff that his, the, the unfortunate things that his family had said in the past, they do also care about him very much. Um, Julian, perhaps if we can have a show of hands for questions, we'll get the mic into the audience while I ask this question of uh, Michelle. How important was it in the telling of the story uh, for you to get those two characters who turned, the interrogator and the military lawyer? In the telling of the story, right. and so f not just in the depiction of the story right. that you and Peter put together on video, but in getting the story where it had to be. Yeah, I mean, uh, when we started, um, when Patrick and I were talking about how we were going to, you know, who we were going to include in the documentary, we really had a cast of characters where everybody who had met Omar had had their lives changed, for better or for worse. So there were the soldiers who were involved in the firefight, and obviously their lives changed that day. But then there were these intriguing characters like Damien Corsetti, who you could, you could make a documentary about you know, unto himself. Mm -hmm. He was, he's, he's, I, I like to think of him as a, as a victim as well. Um, you, you can't excuse the things he did at Bagram. This, he, he doesn't. This is the interrogator. This is the interrogator. Um, Who but, only had half a face, the way but you it, And I'll explain that in a moment. But, he, but he, he, he basically had been sent there as a 22-year-old, angry about 9-11, got there, was told the intelligence you, or at first, he wasn't even there to be an interrogator. And I love that line where he says, I got drunk and so I got punished. I mean, that was the level of expertise at that time because there was such panic. And so he became this interrogator and he's told, what you get from these guys, these guys, is going to save your, your brothers. And, and it doesn't, who are out there fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan, it doesn't, as I said, it doesn't forgive at all what he, he did. He wasn't Omar's interrogator, but he interrogated others, and he was horrendous. But it was meeting Omar that he started to question what he was doing. And, and I think that was really important, you know, to get that perspective in there. The reason for having his face a little bit dark is that, I mean, Damien to this day, and, and maybe you can speak to Damien because Mozam knew him as well, um, he, he has sort of tried to move on. He was actually part of a film, you might have seen Taxi to the Dark Side, which was about the, the um, taxi driver um, who was killed, basically, in, in Bagram. That was the same time that Omar was there. Um, he's, he's tried to move on. He was court-martialed for that case. And he, he reluctantly agreed to be interviewed. I think he felt he, it was kind of his duty to talk about it, and he felt he owed it to Omar, but he wasn't really keen on it. So we asked, he, we didn't do that in any kind of shadowy way to try and make him look like a bad character. He just asked if he could be a little bit um, concealed because he looks quite different today than he did when he was in that film. And so he didn't want to be recognized as he's walked down the street. But I mean, for us, you know, it's, it's I think as a, obviously a sympathetic portrayal comes out and um, we wanted to highlight what happened to him and the tragedy of that. But for both uh, Patrick and myself, you know, it was really essential to get all voices in. Because for so many years, Omar Khadr had just existed, especially in Canada, as this complete character. I mean, he was called, by some, he was called a murderer and a rapist, you know, on the far right. On the far left, Was that he was Trump? That <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's on his radar, thankfully. Yeah. But, um, he, uh, but by others, he was called Nelson Mandela. And, you know, he was, he was not either, and he didn't want to be either. So we were, we really wanted to sort of break down that character, but not do it in sort of a very overt activist way. That wasn't our, 
our mission in doing this. I mean, we wanted to show all the voices that we could and try and do a full picture. Corey, maybe you can pick up on, on, on the prosecutor who turns and you're watching that just as a, you know, as a lawyer who's watching the film. That can't be very common. <laughs> you know, there are more of them than you would think, though. Right. He's not the only one. There's no. a guy called Daryl Vandeveld, who was Binyam Muhammad's uh, prosecutor, and he also basically, he decided he couldn't do it anymore when it was clear he wasn't going to be permitted to turn over evidence of Binyam's torture to the yeah. defense. Did the thing is about prosecutors. But did he allow himself to be interviewed? Oh. Well, like actually, Daryl at some point has given some interviews. He has given some interviews. There, I mean, listen, there aren't dozens of them. Yeah. But I think... It has been quite important when people like Mo Davis or Daryl Vandeveld break ranks and say from inside the system, no, you know, I came believing that we could get some justice here in these military commissions, but it's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. And if that's true, actually, right, and again, Moza met so many more MPs and staff than, than I ever did, but I think that's actually that's true. Not members of parliament. No. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, military, military police. Military police. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, you know, you learn to speak Gitmo and you kind of forget. Uh, yeah. You kind of forget. There's anyway, so but, many acronyms, yeah. But down the, so excuse my alphabet soup, but down the, down the chain of command, absolutely, right up to individual guards or nurses. Um, even recently, very, very recently, we had a case of a, a nurse who volunteered with the rest of the military people to go down and force feed detainees during the mass hunger strike that's, that happened in the past couple of years. And he ultimately decided that it wasn't what he had been told and he refused to do it anymore and he's been um, chucked off Guantanamo and threatened with the court martial and all the rest of it. So I think not only the fact that you have these dissenters but that they're in a position where they can do it without kind of massive retaliation I think is really quite important. Question from the audience? We'll take our first question at the back, and in the meantime, can I get a show of hands of, of other people who had questions in mind? Okay. Um, if you want to offer a name, if you want to offer an affiliation, if that helps contextualize things, feel <coughs> free. Uh, no affiliation. Uh, my name's Luke Dovacim. <coughs> and this uh, was just a, a brilliant and appalling film, but just brilliant film. Um, and appalling is for what it uh, shows and iterates. And this sounds like a a glib question, uh, but it's not. There's uh, the beginning of a Clash song called uh, Working for the Clampdown, and the beginning of it is, what are we going to do now? <laughs> what are we going to do now in this pluralistic, democratic, legalistic society with, with something as appalling as what, what is happening at Guantanamo? It's still open. Sorry to ask such a random question, but... No, it's not random. It's just a, it's a big question, and, and I'm sure Corey and Mozum have probably more insightful answers than I do. But um, I think, you know, in, in terms of the Guantanamo question, I remember I was actually in Guantanamo when um, Obama came, was inaugurated and signed the executive order, and I think I was one of the naive Canadian reporters who thought, okay, you know, this was, I think it was my 19th trip at that point. This is it. This place is going to shut. And I remember one of my Washington Post colleagues was like, not going to be so easy. And he just knew. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next year. Uh, just today, there were a few more detainees that were transferred. So the population is down to, I think, 91 now with 34 of those uh, detainees who have been cleared to be released for years. Uh, but closing Guantanamo is actually not closing, I mean, it's closing a facility, but it's actually moving it to, to U.S. soil. Um, so on the bigger political question, there's a lot of questions. Um, but I think, you know, what makes this story and this issue relevant today is that we're in a similar period now. Um, I covered 9-11 in New York. My beat is national security, and I've never seen so many parallels in the last year in terms of what we're doing with the Islamic State. and and the policies that have come into place. And, and they're difficult issues. I mean, I've never seen them as black and white issues. And I've been able, you know, lucky enough on my beat to report from Somalia and Yemen and all sorts of places in that, you know, I can see both sides. I can see the difficult choices that governments make, but I can also see that this is a war of ideologies and it's long term and what we do today is going to resonate 15 years from now. What we did 15 years ago is resonating today and I truly believe you know there's a it's not it's not the only simplistic reason there's many reasons for the Islamic State and the rise of the Islamic State but it's no coincidence that they parade their prisoners in orange jumpsuits you know and that war of ideology is really important so that's a very long-winded way to answer your question but but I think it's yeah there's there's 
what happens now is going to impact later. Well, we'll put some hands up, get another, question, another question while while we're getting ready for that. Moism, do you even follow the machinations around the Guantanamo close it debate? Do you even bother? Oh yeah. Afraid so. <laughs> I'm afraid so. Um, somebody has to, don't they? Yeah. Um, uh, just just one point on um, Damon Corsetti. He's somebody that I knew in in Bagram. Um, he wasn't bad to me because he wasn't my interrogator. Had he been, he probably would have been. Uh, but he had two nicknames there. He had one was Monster, as he said, but he was also called the King of Torture. Um, and it was his persona that was designed, that, that had been created there, that was designed to terrify the prisoners. Um, and the really odd thing is that he gave me a book. So he used to walk past myself sometimes and we'd engage in conversation. I was the, one of the few English speakers there. And he gave me a book that I still have to this day. And it's called Catch-22. <laughs> um, I know it's bizarre, but I still have it sitting on my, on my shelf. Uh, in, in, in relation to Guantanamo, I simply want to say what, in terms of what's next, Obama did promise to close Guantanamo. He's got about 11 months before his term in office ends. He can, but he's just got to change the language. It's going to be really hard for him to do that, but as a constitutional lawyer, he knows that he can. I.e., Guantanamo is filled with people who have been held without charge or trial, mostly, um, for 14 years. According to the letter of, of the law, they're either not guilty because they've not been tried in any, or even more specific, they're innocent. And if he uses that word, it will open the floodgates of allowing the releases of those people that they don't want to, char to charge. Now, I've gone into all of that and I've forgotten your question. <laughs> <laughs> I think you answered it. Okay, well, you're still you following it. Is, uh, so, yes, the answer is I'm still following it. Um, <laughs> and, and every day you see, or every few weeks, you see a few releases. But I have to say, I was only in that place in total for two years, one year in Bagram, two in Guantanamo. When I stood with Shakar Ahmed the other day, I felt completely um, unqualified to talk about Guantanamo anymore. I have a question over here. Um, hi. Thank you for the movie. I carry both uh, Canadian and American citizenship, and it was an experience as a citizen of those two countries <laughs> to sit and watch that. I was curious in particular about the gentleman going by the alias. Um, if you can tell us a little bit about who he was and why he perhaps agreed to be in the film, because he didn't seem to have had a change of heart in the same way that so many of the other American characters had. Yeah, he's, I mean, Ron Taylor, as we call him, he, he's, he's kind of complicated, and I've had some correspondence with him since, and I, I think he, he does have a bit more of a nuanced view today. Um, he's somebody that I actually met, I didn't know I'd met him, but I met him in Guantanamo back in 2010 when um, there was supposed to be a trial for Omar and then he ended up pleading guilty and we never had the trial. And I remember being at, uh, I mean, Guantanamo is this, as a journalist, as a lawyer going there, bizarre place. I mean, it's this, it's, it's obviously this notorious prison, but it's also a s weird, small American small little town. Small town, yeah. I mean, there's a Starbucks, there's a drive-in theater. Burger and King. There's a <laughs> not for the prisoners. <laughs> not for the prisoners. I mean, it's it's almost two places, but when you go there, it's so incredibly surreal. And uh, I mean, there's the tiki bar, and it's it's just it's it's a classic kind of U.S. military base where they try and recreate, you know, a small town in America on this Cuban soil that is Guantanamo. Um, I met him at the airport when we were leaving, and we knew that there had been these sort of special forces soldiers that had been brought in to testify, but they never got a chance to testify, and the, our handlers had kind of kept us away from them. But as we were about to leave, I talk, started talking to a few of them, and I remember having small talk with a couple and giving my card to them. And um, then out of the blue, when we started making this documentary, I got an email from him saying, um, you probably won't remember me. I met you. You gave me your card. I'm leaving the, the military, and I think I might be able to talk about this case. And so at that point, I thought, oh, well, <laughs> would you talk on camera? And he agreed. Um, you know, he's, yeah, he's, he, in some ways, he hasn't had a, a change of heart. I don't think he, his views necessarily reflect the views of all the Special Forces soldiers that were there. I've had other conversations, not on camera with them, some for the book. Um, and they all have different views. And again, I mean, that goes back to the kind of the central theme of we look at these stories in such black and white terms when, when they're not that way. And you have an interrogator who gives a detainee catch-22. And you have other 
people react the way you expect them to, and, and others you don't. Even the language around this story, hands please, even the language around this story. Uh, one of the things we do on our show is whenever one of our young producers uses the word or writes the word detainee, mm. I say, we don't use that word. Mm. To be detained, that's what happens when the police stop you for a <laughs> speeding violation. This is their word. This is a word that they have implanted. You know, these are prisoners. Well, there's. I have a. I have a. Yeah. So a comment about that actually, because when I first came to reprieve all those years ago, that was absolutely reprieve policy. It was, heck no, we're not going to call them detainees. We're going to call them <laughs> prisoners because that's what it is. And I, my attitude has softened on it over the years only because I think that the word detainee now is so tainted and so associated with this idea of extra legal detention that, may, that it almost feels like people, that you could kind of turn their new speak against them. I mean, maybe that's not right. But, but just a background on that, I mean, the reason that they would, and you would be corrected by public affairs officials if you use the word prisoner, and the reason why they didn't want you to use the prisoner, and I use both in, in when I'm writing about it, is because as a prisoner of war, you're afforded certain rights under the Geneva Convention. And because this was Guantanamo and it was outside, it was only within the spirit of the Geneva Conventions, you couldn't call them that. But, the but you're other still a prisoner. No, of yeah, course. Yeah, and this is why absolutely. I mean, no one who is in jail for a violent crime sure. is called, you know, on an eight, eight to 12 year sentence is right. called a, a detainee. detainee. Yeah. Right. But there, I mean, that's, that's just Cuba and Afghanistan. And but they, but they, you, they created it. There was a whole lexicon that you used, and my favorite one. Oh yeah, we'll all have our favorites, I'm sure. <laughs> my favorite one, and this, this was only one public affairs commander who, official who, uh, who loved to correct you when you say that. When you said um, interrogation, and the word that they used there was reservation. And so I remember there was like, like a restaurant. A yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it was like the detainee will be brought for the reservation at 7 p.m. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we just were sort of refused to use that. But that was the language that was used. I have a favorite. Do you have a favorite <laughs> term? Uh, yeah, hostage. Oh, uh, OK, OK. <laughs> mine, was, mine was when they, when, when they rewrote hunger strike. So they've, they've oh, erased yeah. the word hunger strike from their dictionary now. They now call it a non-religious long-term fast. No, 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 really, really. So what's look the up. acronym? N N R, God, cut me on here. N N R L T F. No, no, seriously, in the medical forms, they, you see it right there. Changed. There was a moment, you know, they haven't said force feeding in years. It's, it should it's, be W T F. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Good evening, and thank you very much for a very interesting <coughs> film. I'm wondering if today, from all the prisoners of Guantanamo, you know how many were really uh, bad people who were supposed to be put into jail, or if you don't know? I mean, that's, that's a difficult question. I think that one of the things that the times I've gone down there to, to cover the 9-11 trials, which are in pretrial hearings now and have been going on for years and um, will go on for years, and it's been called sometimes the trial of the century, whereas some of the defense lawyers say this is the trial that's going to take a century <laughs> to be completed. Um, when I look at someone like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who is the alleged you know, al-Qaeda number three, I feel if that was someone who had been brought to a US court, I mean, the US tries alleged terrorists all the time. They get convicted. There is a process. They go away to the Colorado prison, and they're never heard from again. I mean, I feel that actually, if anything, Guantanamo has given the the bad guys. I mean, the, what what you say is the truly guilty of of what are war crimes or or domestic crimes has given them a pr platform that they should not have. But in terms of you know determining who, I mean, I hate sort of bad guy, good guy term. But in terms of who is guilty of of war crimes or crimes under U.S. law. Um, the number now, and you can hopefully correct me on this, but I think we're down to 91 detainees. Of those detainees, 34 have been cleared for release by the Pentagon, which is all the U.S. departments, so CIA, all have agreed that these are people that are cleared for release. Um, and then you have a, another number, which I can't remember, of how many will be tried. And then I think it's 47 who are called sort of these indefinite detainees, forever prisoners, they call them. And they're people that they, they don't want it. They haven't been cleared for release. They don't want to release, but they don't have the evidence, or they don't have clean evidence. I.e., they haven't had mistreatment um, or evidence that would stand up in court to be tried. So it's 
Well, oh, no, 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 absolutely not. No, listen, more people have died in Guantanamo than have ever been convicted of an offense. And that's even including the made-up military commissions processes that don't look like anything you would recognize as a trial. There's been one prisoner ever brought to a federal court, and yes, he was convicted. Um, but the reality is, if there was more evidence on pretty much anyone in Guantanamo, um, th th there have been some, I think, stupid choices made with people like, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, where you know, people, it, obviously we've tortured them, and therefore the administration is avoiding putting them in federal court. But they should have just been charged. That's what the that's what the system is for. It's like Wasim says: if you think that somebody committed an offense, put them right. on. Trial. Yeah, I don't feel everybody who's gone there has been innocent by any means. Um, but but also, I mean, I mean, I have to ask this question: What do you mean by a bad guy? Because ev everybody, I, I don't mean you. I mean the <laughs> Americans. Yeah. Um, because the Americans have never said that we got it wrong in any case. Yeah. They've never apologized to anyone. They've never uh, done any process whereby they've tried to rectify the problem. If they wanted to, and they have done, they've released Taliban ministers. Mm -hmm. They've re released yeah. bodyguards of Osama bin Laden. They've released his driver and his cook yeah. and God knows what else, uh, who they said were the worst, most dangerous terrorists. Mm. So how do you quantify? How do you decide? Um, and the answer is you don't. You just make it up as you go along. And when you have deals with various governments, uh, that's what trumps everything else. And really, this has very little to do about justice. In Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's case, he's probably the, you know, the, the smoking gun in all of this. Uh, but they waterboarded him over 183 times, tortured his children in front of him. So any use of any evidence of against him that they could have used in federal court could not be admiss admissible. Um, therefore, he remains in Guantanamo. Um, without us getting to see any of the evidence. I think one of the problems, sorry, to me, but I think one of the problems, and, and feel free to disagree, but I think Guantanamo wasn't created as a place to have war crimes. I mean, it was created as an intelligence gathering operation. And, and so I think that from the start is what started all the problems. And it was, it's sort of that panic and after 9-11 to sort of disregard norms that we have for these types of interrogations. Um, and I think after that, everything was done backwards. Well, yeah, and yeah, that's that's exactly the problem. The, oh, it's the kind of the the mess that comes from trying to do a grab bag of um, military detention and and the criminal law. You know, the Geneva Conventions say you can have a POW camp. That there are ways you have to treat those people, um, and you certainly can't move them to Guantanamo Bay. That's in itself actually a a, a war crime. It's a violation of. Um, it's a violation of the Geneva Conventions, but the, but the basic problem that the Bush administration created and that we're still contending with today, not just in Guantanamo, but right across the, right across the spectrum of counterterrorism abuses is this idea that they can kind of pick and choose the most, you know, government authority granting parts of the criminal law and the military law. I want to get, go to this next question right away, but I just want to plant one thought with Michelle to think about while, uh, and that is there has to be a story uh, about the Canadian media, something that somebody who wasn't covering the story said to you somewhere along the way about your work or them not being on the job, there's got to be an anecdote, and I'm going to try to pull that out of you after this question. <laughs> and then I have a question for you. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> you got a journalist up here and the table's turn. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's not really a question as such. Um, I've been campaigning for Omar and Guantanamo for the last five years. And I just want to thank you for um, being able to get the naturalness of Omar and Dennis, because I was able to stay with them when Omar was released. And I just wanted to s remind people that he's only released on bail, and the government are still appealing against that release and wanting him back in prison, which would be horrendous, because Omar has now um, finished his um, off, um, university right. um, for ERM, for emergency um, medical right. um, responder, because he wants to work in the medical profession. He, as a young child, he wanted to be a doctor, but of course now he's nearly 30 this year. Right. It's not going to be, and I just want to thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Because what you saw between Dennis and Patricia yeah, it's Omar a beautiful relationship. Yeah, was it's completely natural. What you saw is what you get. It's amazing. I mean, a lo much of his success is because of the mm. people that have been around him. And, and and I just want to say that Dennis is still um, paying for Omar's um, legal fees and everything. And so, if anybody wants to give a donation <laughs> for his legal fees, 
if you go to the free Omar Kadar Now site, then you might be able to. Thank you, I'm sorry, but Thanks. as I say, I've been campaigning for Omar for, for, for so long, and it's so lovely to see a He's room full of people watching the film. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, as you say, it's, they're an incredible couple, and they've been, They've they've taken you know it's been incredible financial and personal cost and now there's quite a momentum and, and sympathy and kind of the dials turned a little but for early days I mean back in the early you know 2003 2004 when there weren't people campaigning for Omar Khadr and I mean they were getting death threats for especially in Canada because I don't know you know if you're not if you're not Canadian you might not appreciate how much his family was was hated in Canada and that really was you know the cloud over his case the entire time but yeah they're they're incredible people and um, we haven't had to change that line in the film yet about the Canadian government uh, appealing his mm. release we might at some point we have a new government now you might have heard about our new Prime Minister with fantastic hair. Um, <laughs> but uh, they are now reviewing that case and all the cases. Um, so we, I'll be shocked if they don't drop that appeal because the Liberal government has been, was very critical how the uh, Harper government handled the case. So I expect that to be dropped, um, but we'll see. Ask your question. You've, you've answered it. I was just going to, uh, how would you have seen Canada had you had, a, had, you had Trudeau in power um, from say the time when Omar Khadr was taken into custody till now what? do you think that it, it's just the government that shaped the view or was it something more than that I think it's it's complicated it did sense. it did it did start under the Liberals so it started under a different Liberal government but um, you know it's hard now to remember back what it was like in those first couple years after 9-11 but I, I remember it from covering 9-11 and feeling that fear that there was going to be another attack and and people that normally were um, you know would never sacrifice civil rights for security were letting things go that they normally never would there was such fear at that time and there certainly wasn't a lot of pressure on the liberal government then to try and get this 15 year old back home and they were not advocating I think had time when time went on the liberals would have probably advocated a lot harder. The, there came a point, and we could have made a whole other film about the legal drama. And I mean, Dennis was one huge player, but and his partner Nate Whitling. Um, but there were all sorts of American lawyers that were involved too. I mean, there was insane legal drama mm -hmm. on that case. Um, but I mean, I think at one point the Americans were wanted Omar Khadr out of there. And the Canadian government was uh, was Lobby. not was not yeah they were lobbying to keep him there, and at one point actually it, it's come out since in documents that Hillary Clinton had to get involved personally to get him out of there in part because it looked terrible on the Obama administration to have this child soldier there, uh, but also because the other prisoners were talking about the case and they're like oh there's this deal that the Canadian signed he was supposed to be out of Guantanamo in a year and he's still there. So all the other deals the Pentagon was trying to sign were in jeopardy. And at that point, at that point, the Canadian government was holding back. So, I mean, it was really quite amazing what they were doing. But to be fair, I mean, the Canadian public wasn't really rallying for it. We'll get to them. Okay. Uh, Hi. Go ahead. My name is uh, sorry, Martin. we've got two more questions, this one and one more, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. Uh, my suggestion, uh, usually the guests are available for, you know, or two afterwards. So if we can't get to your question with the microphone, I'd invite you up after, on their behalf without checking. <laughs> Hi. Uh, we learned in the news today that um, there was a Gemini prisoner detainee who was about to be released into a country he didn't know. Right. And he rather went back into his cell. Right. Um, what does that tell us about the psychology of the place? And maybe for Mr. Big, can you relate to that in any way? Uh, I can't because I'm British and I came back to Britain, but I can relate it in relation to numerous prisoners I've visited around the world who've been, quote unquote, resettled to countries where they have absolutely zero <coughs> connection to. Um, there's been prisoners that have been found, that have been sent to places like Palau, which I think most people wouldn't even know where it is on the map. Uh, and you, so if you take, you know, six Chinese or, or Uyghurs uh, from uh, Turkic speaking people and send them over to these islands, or if you send, um, a Syrian and some Tunisians over to Uruguay, whilst it's 
and what the countries do in terms of welcoming these individuals is 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 um, is, is praiseworthy. It doesn't do very much for the individual who's trying to live his life. He's from an Arab uh, background, for example, so the best thing to do would be to send him to, if not his own ho home nation, to another nation that borders that country, where he can um, reasonably be able to see his family members, communicate with them, uh, be in a society where he fits in, where he doesn't feel like an outsider. <laughs> and so this, in, this, this um, uh, Yemeni prisoner who, who, who refused to go at the last minute, I mean, everybody wants to be released from Guantanamo, and the majority have accepted the resettlement deals. In fact, most of them, uh, all of them have. Um, he may have some personal issues that he's worried about, but there's also a sense of at least you know Guantanamo. Mm. You, you know the prisoners around there. You even know, go, know the guards. Mm. Once you walk out into a situation where you don't know the language, the culture, the people, and what, what, how they'll react towards you, it's a great deal of fear. So I'm, I'm sure that that's part of uh, uh, of it. And I think his attorney in that piece I read today compared him to a character in Shawshank Redemption, yeah, yeah. Brooke, who, who didn't want it, was so scared to be outside of this place. And I think probably Omar refers to that in the film too at one point when he said Dennis's visits were so hard because you get, you kind of learn this system and you learn how to survive in Guantanamo. And then Dennis would come down there and he wouldn't talk about the law, he'd talk about hope and living on the outside. And that scared him. So I, I, yeah, that was a fascinating story today. I'd, I'd love to hear more what was going on or what country he was supposed to go to. But um, it, it kind of does make sense when you think of the psyche of being in that place for so long and being told so many times you're going to leave and, and then you don't. And it's also the only agency that you really have. You have no control over your own life, really. The only, the last decision left to you, very, very occasionally, is to say no. And you see that a lot with the guys. It's quite common, actually. I'm going to refuse because because you have no power to decide anything. So I'm going to refuse to see my lawyer or wreck or to talk to my family or indeed, in its most powerful state, to refuse food. So I think I mean what Moazim says is exactly right, which is that people are set places where they have no ties, no family, and and feel quite quickly adrift. And I think that must have been part of it. And he wasn't one of my clients, but um, but also I think there is that element of of exercising the only ability to choose that you have and saying no, even when it means that you stay in Guantanamo. Well, Julianne finds the last question. <laughs> uh, Michelle is going to tell us that little anecdote. I don't uh, know. I forgot to think about that. No, well, I, I mean, well, I guess I mean the, the, another way to put the question is, journalists don't <laughs> like to work in packs, but it must, <laughs> it must have been a little bit lonely because, I mean, you have to understand what this woman did on Guantanamo. At one stage, they banned her, uh, along with Carol Rosenberg, Paul Corey. Who was the fourth? Um, oh, I can't remember. The, the, there was yeah. a fourth. That, you know, yeah. uh, the, 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 and then Secret media Edwards. organizations yeah. lobbied really hard to get this crew back in there. Not as far as I can tell, because they wanted to cover the place. <laughs> they weren't going to bother. But a lot of media organizations that never showed any interest in Guantanamo Bay put their hands up and said, "No, no, this is wrong because you're banning the media." And then once this they were allowed back, this is what journalists are like. I mean, we can be so <laughs> we can be so terribly competitive with yeah, but, each other, okay, but, but then but if you attack journalism, we're like this right, angry yeah. pack. But in this case, together, they weren't so. competing. Most no, of no, organizations. it was wonderful. It was it was yeah. the symbolic aspect of of the ban. Right. So, but just talk to us a little <laughs> bit about the the op living in the uh, in the opposite side of the spectrum from the pack? Was well, it lonely for well, you? Well, no, but the weird thing, is, that was the weird thing about Guantanamo, and I think Corey can relate to this too, is that it became, um, it became almost, it did become pack journalism because you were there as a unit. So someone like Carol Rosenberg, who, you know, was a hero for Okay, but in years. Canada, your competitors, the people you're going <laughs> head to head with, sorry, I'm just going to cut to the chase yeah, here. Sorry. It's because he's Canadian. Post yeah. Media Group in Canada <laughs> is not Murdoch and News Corp. But they, they're conservative, right. and they're the biggest newspaper group in the country. Sure. You had a state, you had sure. a state-owned channel, the CBC, with a tremendous reputation for proper journalism over the years. That, like the BBC here, running a little bit scared with conservative governments and more cuts looming over them. That was the environment. The private CTV, Global, <laughs> they didn't want to know. Look, it's because this, he does listening posts, which then no, no, covers but, the. Well, that's the my world, but you have to understand, 
This is a rock star journalist to call no. her anything <laughs> less than that. Okay, that's not true. But it is true. No, it's it is no, true. It's true. It to is call true. her anything less than that is to take the British art of understatement to another fucking <laughs> level. Okay? And I want to get it. I just want to get it how lonely. You got to give me okay. something on that, okay. Michelle, because like I'm not gonna quit. To be fair, there were there were quite a few Canadian journalists who covered this. I was very I was lucky in that I'm, I'm being very Canadian maybe, but I was lucky in that the star let me various editors over the year years at the end a particular editor let me stay on this because covering Guantanamo was onerous and they made it onerous. I mean, I think that was by design that when you went down there you had to sign ground rules before you went down. You were out of circulation for at least a week because you had to take these, you know, ridiculous military flights. It was it was a lot of time, it was it was a lot of money. And I, I do feel very lucky that, you know, the star kept me on this story. Very thankful. You're you're gonna um, answer the question better than her, aren't <laughs> no, you? I am. Go but, ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, do it. I think the testament to Michelle's power as a reporter and her tenacity in the story is the fact that that footage exists of Omar coming out. I mean, he obviously had seen her work and knew that it spoke for itself because for him to have that kind of trust in a reporter. Well, he didn't want it to be fair. He didn't want to do the interview, and he, um, when he was in, no, I'm, that's I'm not gratitude trying to be, for you. No, when, at one point, he didn't. I mean, when he was in prison, I think he he was he was willing to do the interview, and then when he got out, he did that press conference at the end of his street, which was incredible. And people later said, oh, he was so coached and he was so prepared. And we were there. He wasn't. He didn't actually want to do that, but he had a media circus on his street. So he had to go address the media and that was all kind of off the cuff. And there was a sense, and I don't blame him, but at that point he's like, okay, I'm done. I did my press conference at the end of the street. I've addressed the Canadian public. I've done my duty. Go away. <laughs> to which point I'm like, oh, but, uh, excuse me, <laughs> we've been on this for a few years and we really had to talk him into it. Um, but, but thank you, very kind of you. I mean, I think it was because more my relationship with Dennis over the years, and you know, there were times, sure, there were times when it got very lonely where Dennis and I would say, you know, the only two people that have been consistent mm -hmm. over the years. And there were, I mean, it was, as I said, it's a very sympathetic audience to, to some degree now, but in Canada, the case still remains very divided. And there was, I won't mention by name, but some, you know, very right-wing media that um, would happily attack you. And anytime you'd write about this, I mean, you would get you know, death threats, really. I mean, people were that angry about the case. And my favorite, I shouldn't even give this credit, but my favorite attack was at one point, there was myself and um, a professor who went down and helped uh, Omar. He would, he would, she would actually give him lessons in Guantanamo. And it's at the, she's from the university where he now attends in, um, in Edmonton. And there was a child psychologist who worked with him. Uh, another woman, and she's not in the film, but there was a right-wing television uh, personality in Canada who did a whole segment called C Cougars for Cotter. Oh my God! <laughs> Where they had all three of our pictures, and I remember at the time. So sexist, also being, amazing. Being, I like that. Yeah, it was very <laughs> sexist, but I, I remember being furious at the time because not because my you know journalism objectivity <laughs> was being cougar. challenged, but I thought, oh, I've become a, I'm, a I'm old enough girl. to be a cougar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When did that happen? That's so, worthy. That's worthy that's of a just, British tabloid. Yeah, that's there you just go. like Noah's and Beg, you know. Um, <laughs> having real difficulty with the fact he wore the same jumper in the film <laughs> tonight. The things that get to us, huh? <laughs> there you go. Um, firstly, thank you very much. I thought it was an uh, amazing film. Um, and then I was very struck how uh, visually Omar constantly had, um, had a, a smile, which <laughs> this kind of half smile, which was slightly unnerving at t because it was pretty much throughout. And then at one stage he actually says, well, you learn how to hide your emotions, and, yeah. and, and you really feel that that was true. And and the, the only time that that really cracked was when the, the cop came to the door. Yeah, when you right. when the dogs came first, the the sound of the dogs, and right. and you could you got a little hint of what was going on inside. And you mentioned also um, the things that come at night. Um, and I suppose my question is, what kind of help do do, do these people get to try and address? you know, their experience. Well, I'll let Mozam talk about the psychological trauma you go through after, but I think, you know, this is what I said earlier, he was actually quite fortunate in the people he had around him. So Steven Zanakis, who's in the film, the, the forensic psychiatrist, spent over 200 hours with him in Guantanamo. Uh, Kate Porterfield, who is the child psychologist who's not in the film, she spent the same amount of time. 
And I think a lot of what we saw, and he addresses this in the film, is that this is his freedom high. I mean, we had his first three days of freedom with him. If it were a different documentary, one would have been great to, to make, is if you could spend three years with him and see how he progresses. So I think of a lot of what you see there is him coping. And he's still in kind of the prison mentality that this is how I cope with my emotions, this is how I survive. And when he says there that that guard was tormenting him, and he had sort of the, the power to say, I'm not going to let this get to me. I feel sorry for him. I mean, I wish I had that power. I mean, I think that was a real kind of survival, survival mechanism, and that's what we're seeing. So he was, in a lot of ways, he was very controlled. And I think when the cops came to the door at that point, Patrick and I switched off interviewing him. And I think at that point, Patrick was interviewing him. And once the cop left, he said, you were really scared. You were, no, I wasn't. I was fine. But he was, right? You saw that emotion. And that's absolutely natural. But I think there was a lot of control. And um, I think from all I've heard, he's been doing really well since. Uh, there's an Edmonton screening tonight, actually, that he's going to. Um, he's not a fan of being in the spotlight, but I think he's going to come for that. Um, and I think what Dennis says is he's coping, but I'm sure he's going to go through all sorts of up and ups and downs when he has to actually deal with life, you know, and, and deal with life on the outside. I'm sure you went through that and, and continue um, to go through it. I think Omar, for me, is, is, is one of these few stories that you hear in, in this world that's becoming increasingly um, uh, diametrically opposed, it seems. But he's one of those cases. Not only is a former Guantanamo prisoner, not only is, a, is he a Canadian, not only is he a Khadr, but he's also somebody from the Muslim community. And f it's, for me, he comports himself in the way that I wish many of us could or would, despite his, um, his trauma. Uh, when he says and comes out in front of the world television and says, uh, um, I want to tell Harper that I, I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint him, but I'm better than what he thinks of me. Um, that encapsulates everything of what you've done to this guy and his ability, and I would say the ability of numerous prisoners, not just him, um, to not carry with them the hatred, the desire for retribution, the anger, the sorrow, the fear, the pain. You know, what you didn't see also in this film which what happened to majority of the prisoners, but it probably didn't happen to Omar because he was already in a horrible state. He was brought into custody. He was already stripped naked while he was wounded. He was already humiliated. But the way they treated us when they brought us into custody, you would not, you're not allowed to treat an animal this way, no animal. And so that dehumanization, a, a, a glimpse of which you may have seen with the Abu Ghraib pitch, pictures. Remember, um, General Miller went to Abu Ghraib to Guantanamo eyes the, 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 the war, the, the, the uh, um, detention process. So we were going through that already. To come out of that after everything that the guys have gone through and say, I, I'm actually not bitter. I feel sorry for the people who uh, uh, abused me. But also, I'm a friend. I'm a friend of many of those soldiers who guarded us. I have like about 15 of them on, on Facebook who, who are friends. <laughs> and about five of them, <laughs> the last time I saw them was Guantanamo. And they are friends. I will call them true friends because they saw the opposite side of us, but they did see us in a, in a, in a circumstance where nobody else knows us. And uh, so part of that has been our healing process. Um, but again, that story, again, it's not one that governments want you to hear. I toured in the UK with one of these guys, and uh, Omar the is one of the, the, uh, um, the British prisoners, and Jar Allah from, from Qatar. We toured all British universities, and we ended up in Cardiff with its largest turnout ever. About 1,500 people came to, to watch this discussion between former Guantanamo guard and prisoner. Um, but the British government had detained, or the, the airport authorities had detained him at the airport and threatened to not let him into the country. Uh, why? Because Where was that? Where was that? Yeah, in, in the, the UK. UK. And so th there are parts of this story that I think will continue to develop, but it will be between us as individuals and, uh, and everybody else that's connected to us.
can I say a last thing just to bring it yeah, bang no, up to the your, present? This is your summary argument. This is my summary argument, <laughs> right. So I want to return to the first question, which was asked, what now? It would be easy to fool ourselves by looking at the historical footage and hearing these stories that everything was cleaned up when Obama took office and that although he has failed in his well intentions, it's actually the seventh anniversary of that promise to close Gitmo today, um, that there's nothing that would disturb all of us going on there right now. Uh, another thing has happened in the past 48 hours, actually, which uh, I wish hadn't happened because it would show you that all isn't well in Guantanamo now. Um, yesterday, the Obama administration, the most transparent administration in history, uh, as he said it was going to be, um, filed an appeal in federal court against 16 media organizations ha trying to have um, the first ever footage of force feeding of a Guantanamo detainee made public. Um, it's about 11 hours of stuff. I've watched it. It was another one of my clients. Um, we won it in a federal court case. But it's not from 2003 or 2004. It's not pretty, and it's from 2013 and 2014. There are still people on hunger strike being force fed in a way that would appall you even now. And I'm sorry to say that the administration is fighting to have that footage suppressed so that you can't see what it really looks like. So these aren't just, you know, they're not just historical issues for the people who are living there, you know, and uh, there is still profoundly a need for people to keep on the United States and make sure that we actually do put this behind us and into the history books where it belongs. I want to thank Corey Kreider and Melissa and Beg for being here tonight. Uh, once again, Peter Raymond at the back produced the film. Michelle Shepard wrote the book on Guantanamo and Cotter, made a terrific film. Uh, thank you for the film, and uh, we wish you nothing but the best. Okay, Let's go to the bar. <laughs>